What you're about to see and hear exists in reality in Jamaica and has become one of the many unfortunate chapters. After accepting loans and conditionalities from the World Bank, lost its largest cash crop markets due to competition with Western imports. Today, countless farmers are out of work, for they are unable to compete with the large corporations. Greetings, massive. Wagwan, Jamaica. Towards the end of the 1960s, when Jamaica was amongst the fastest growing economies in the world, we received what was up until that point the largest loan to a developing country granted by the World Bank, and we received that loan for educational purposes, to build schools and institutions that would have been able to receive the influx of young people seeking an educational opportunity in the years after independence. The loan did not achieve its purpose as intended. There were immense cost overruns, 100%, which contributed to the beginnings of our debt, and which had we not had those overruns, we could have built 50 more schools. Reason? Partisan political award of contracts, not on the basis of merit, not on the basis of competence, but on the basis of party connection. And of course, the contractors gave back to the politicians, to the party, kickbacks in appreciation for this political corrupt behavior. Jamaica suffered then, and we continue to suffer now from this political corruption that we need to bring to an end. Education is a key. After five decades of independence, a lot of Jamaicans have begun to have doubts as to whether independence is a good thing. And when you look at the problems that Jamaica face, you can trace many of them to a weak or a non-performing education and training system. For me, there are two main objectives about an education and training system. And if it is effective, you'll see it in a productive labor force. Jamaica has one of the least productive labor forces in the Caribbean, much more in the world today. Out of a labor force of some 1.3, 1.4 million, over 900,000 have no training at all. Among the thousands of unemployed, many of them have been to secondary school for four years or more, and they don't have one piece of certification. The second objective about an education and training system, and if it is good, it does what I would say, build a more socially cohesive society. Everybody has the same learning experience for the first 11, 12 years. They are able to settle disputes without resorting to violence. I mean, ignorance, I mean, I mean the simplest thing, they, they will probably blow out and take it out of proportion and act aggressive towards, while other persons with a more intellectual level, will probably reason it out. As, as how we learn in the, the primary system, talk it out, don't fight it out, the conflict system. Them just fight for no reason sometimes. Legal is this thing, then escalate and they don't have a big fight. If you are educated, then you will know what to say, what to do, and take a stand. It's not because a politician has put, a, put a money in your pocket, or put something in your pocket, you can't say, yo, I put turn a blind eye to certain things. You need to be more educated in doing stuff and some of the things that you're saying. For the first time in 1953, 
Jamaican elected Jamaicans became ministers of government. They started to have a bigger say. Up to that time, only 1% was enrolled in the high schools in the country. And so, the decade before independence, Jamaica was well on its way to establishing a first-rate education and training system. On the technical side, the College of Arts, Science and Technology was established. And the technical schools, Kingston Technical, Homewood Technical, Dintel Technical, and then St. Elizabeth Technical, were all given a modern science curriculum. And graduates would feed into the College of Science, Arts and Technology. The effect was there. Within three years, Jamaicans were now staff in the bauxite industry. The Jamaican economy grew faster in the decade between 1953 and 1963 than the economy of any developing country in the world. And the prestige of Jamaica was such that in 1966, Jamaica was selected by the World Bank for a very special loan for education purposes. The amount of money is 9.5 million. But place that in context for the 10 years or for the period, more than 10 years, between 1953 and 1966, only 4.5 million was spent on secondary education. And you're now getting a loan of 9.5. And what this means is that in one shot, between three years, it should have been a three-year program, 1966 to 1969, you would almost have doubled your capacity for secondary education. The way how we spent it gave education and training a setback from which it has never recovered. It is important that we make some connections with our history. The departure from course during this period of industrialization and industrial development was not due to external forces. It was due to the misadventure of the PNP, which diverted us from the path of economic growth, selling the people of Jamaica false hope and unrealistic dreams for which the country is still paying today. Those countries that were not distracted from the path of economic development and maintained a steady and balanced course, managed to align their education systems and their economies to take advantage of the opportunities of industrialization, even if they were lagging behind at the time of the third industrial revolution. The government of the day called in Dr. Arthur Burt. He made one very, very important change to the method of hiring contractors. And that was whereas before there was an established panel of contractors, certified, who members of parliament could recommend from. But a panel at the Ministry of Education would have the final say in choosing. That was changed to allow each member of parliament to recommend the contractors who would build the schools in their constituencies. The program lasted not three years, but six. And more importantly, the overrun on the primary school building program was 125%. And the overrun on the secondary school program, 100%. Which means for the money spent, so the, the Jamaican taxpayer should have had twice as many schools. A new administration took government in 1972 
and looking at the school building program and what had gone on, there was a big hue and cry for an investigation. In response to that hue and cry, a commission of inquiry was set up under which came to be known as the Da Costa Commission. Now, the findings of the Da Costa Commission should be read by every Jamaican. And the objective is not so much to remind the population of where guilt or blame is, but to try to make sure that this process is never, and these mistakes are never, ever repeated. Today, Jamaica has a debt of some $1.7 trillion. This debt has been accumulated from the time of the loan for education in 1966. If those monies had all been spent in a way to get value for money, not only would Jamaica be a fully developed country by now, but Jamaica would be able to export capital and assist other countries to develop as well. But we are now faced with this debt of 1.7 trillion, which should have carried us well on the way to economic development by providing useful infrastructure or facilities such as schools and clinics to provide us with first-rate education and health services. And to the extent that those monies were spent without the Jamaican taxpayer getting value for money. You now have the money to pay back, but with a labor force that is far less able to produce the goods and services competitively to pay that money. And for this purpose, more so than anything else, I would recommend that every Jamaican read the report of the Costa Commission just to see how we wasted what I regard as the most important opportunity in the history of independent Jamaica to accelerate the process to provide a first-rate education and training system.